Okay, we are live. Hey guys, welcome to my regular Wednesday night live stream, although this is pre-recorded. And today I have the Australian Protectionist Party. He is a, or you are, a common uh, internet presence on Facebook and I'm assuming on other platforms as well. Thank you for coming on my show. I know it's been um, up and down until I could finally get you on. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good, thanks. It's um, been a warm one in Perth, but um, here we are. Yeah. Well, before we begin, um, I know you've been interviewed already once before by, what was it, was it Maddie or was it, no, it was Maddie, what, right? Yeah, I've been on the um, XYZ live stream three times and um, mm -hmm. I've done a few other interviews with some other people, yes, but um, I'm really looking forward to this one. <laughs> Why? I mean, I actually found it unusual that you reached out. I mean, I'm privileged and I'm happy to have you. Um, most people who ask me, I usually say yes if I find them interesting enough. Otherwise, I'm like, uh, but what was it? What, what made you want to join me on my channel? Um, just because I've been a, a fan of your show. I watch you, you know, um, every Wednesday night. And um, the fact that you've also, you know, interviewed so many interesting guests um, in the last few months. I mean, you interviewed Fraser Anning, you've interviewed Daisy Cousins, you've um, interviewed some fairly prominent people. And um, yeah, I wanted to um, see if I could cash in on that as well, I guess. <laughs> well, I'm happy to have you. It takes a very, very low IQ person to be able to get those people on her channel, don't you think? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> I'm just being silly. All right, cool. Well, let's begin first of all with why you have this media presence. Why are you the Australian Protectionist Party? What is it about? What, why did you create the page, the channel, or what, whatever it is you have in terms of media presence? Why did you create it? Um, well, I'm the West Australian Chairman of the Australian Protectionist Party. The Australian Protectionist Party started back in 2007. And mm -hmm. That basically came about um, because at the time there was a quite a void in Australian politics, certainly in nationalist circles at the time, because, um, I mean, One Nation had sort of made a big impact around the late 1990s, um, but by the early noughties, um, One Nation had sort of fallen apart a bit. You know, Pauline Hanson, I think, had sort of left the party and she was off doing other things like Dancing with the Stars or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it sort of reached a point where um, I think, you know, there was a lot of internal problems within One Nation and it was just felt by a lot of nationalists at the time that, um, you know, nationalism needed a new direction. And so the Australian Protectionist Party was formed and um, uh, I would have been one of the first people in Western Australia to join. I wasn't the original um, WA chairman. I took over that role in 2013. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I've done that role ever since, and I guess I've been a stalwart of the party. Oh, well, there you go. So is this an official political party, or is it more uh, like, is it, is it more like a community, the way the United Patriots front, like they never were an, an official political party, nor was, um, I don't even think the ALA was an official party in that, like nothing ever happened. So how, where, do, where are you guys categorised in that sort of, Totem pole. Yeah, I mean, we, we are an electoral political party. We did contest the um, 2013 election. Um, we since allowed our registration to be, uh, to basically slide. We we felt that it was better at um, this point to, um, to not be registered um, because once you do get registered, you tend to get a lot of, um, uh, the Australian Electoral Commission tends to annoy you a lot with membership um, requests and financial audits and all sort of annoying stuff. So it sort of reached a point where we just said, yeah, okay, we're better off actually being deregistered now, uh, for now anyway. But um, I think, you know, more than anything else, we, um, you know, we're, we're sort of making what I call a contribution to the patriotic swarm. Um, my view is that, you know, um, there's there's a, a big change in the wind. I think that's um, what's happening with the culture war. Um, I personally think that what what's happening at the moment is that we've kind of reached a point where we're, we're at what I would call like a, a 
kind of peak liberalism, and um, which is sort of like you know the, the various elements of liberalism, postmodernism, uh, cultural Marxism, political correctness being taken to ridiculous over the top extremes. And it's just reached a point now where more and more people are starting to realise we need to not go in that direction because, you know, we are going way too far in that direction and we need to push back in the other direction. And, um, you know, I think that consciousness is growing and building and gaining momentum all of the time and I'm absolutely certain that we'll continue to gain momentum that the, the pushback against political correctness will only increase from here. And... Um, Exactly where it leads, I don't know, but I do confidently predict that we are going to see some major social change in the next maybe 10 or 20 years. Um, now what happens with regard to electoral politics, I, I, I don't really know. Obviously, it's been difficult for any micro party to make much mm -hmm. impact electorally in Australian politics um, okay. because the, the system is kind of pretty rigged to... Um, you know, sort of maintain the status quo and keep the dominant um, parties in power. But I also think that, you know, at this time of radical social change, that anything's sort of possible, um, anything's possible with regard to the, um, the changes that I think are coming. So, um, you know, we play our role, we play, you know, we have a website, we have a presence on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Gab and, you know, we're, we're just making our contribution to what I call the patriotic swarm. Okay, well, I think I agree with a, a great deal of what you said. I think it's true that we are gaining momentum. But the thing is, there's so much um, fracture in the, in, in the side of the people who see what we see. The thing is, though, um, there are white nationalists, there are uh, normal patriotic Australians who consider anyone to be an Australian as long as they adhere to to the rules and assimilate. Um, there is so much uh, hatred on the on the on the extreme part of right. Um, you know, people who are collectively hate a whole entire group of people. Where do you stand on all of that, and and, and how do we heal that? Um, I think it's it is a, a sorting out process. I, I think um, you know this. What I perceive as what what's likely to happen is that um, you know it is basically a something of a sorting out process that's going on um, we are inevitably it's a little bit like um, going down the, the what I call the rabbit hole I, I think um, you know we're kind of living in an age now living in a time of um, we're, we're sort of what I call like peak liberalism a lot of brainwashing political correctness has sort of been like, you know, the dominant dogmatism in the modern day West. I think it's effectively replaced Christianity as being like the um, the dominant dogmatism that sets much of the moral agenda. Um, but like I said, um, that's been pushed back against and that pushback's going to continue. Um, but I think, you know, um, there will be inevitably, it's, it's not like, you know, nothing sort of, evolves to to certain on its own sort of thing everything's evolving changing um you know divisions on the political right i think are completely inevitable um i, I think that will you know it's all sorting out process and um you know we'll, we'll see what develops well i thought just came to me is it a sorting out process or should we have it be as broad as possible because unlike the left we, we do think differently about different things. Like, why can't there be, why can't everyone unite and stay friendly and civil, but then there be the pro-Israels, the, the, the nationalists, the, you know, whatever, the, the ones who are pro-choice, the ones who are not, um, because we're not all going to agree. Would you say that that's more realistic? Um. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's hard to say. Not everybody can agree on everything. I mean, human beings have a wide diversity of opinions, and um, you know, there's always going to be a bit of a, a sort of our process to see, you know, what are the best values that ultimately come to prevail. Um, you know, that it just it just happens over time. That's fair enough. Um, 
Well, I was curious as to your opinion regarding, uh, so you said before that in 10 or 20 years, the social attitudes will change again. Uh, so wh what do you think has been the downfall that, what was the, the moment, the catalyst for everything that has taken place? Because Australia initially was known as, you know, oh, larrikinism and yeah. laid back attitude and um, the ability to offend as a joke. Like we are considered a laid back country, but that is slowly deteriorating. W what do you think was the catalyst of that in this specific country, not like the world over? Um, yeah, I just think it's that dominance of what we know as political correctness, which is derived from cultural Marxism. It just became more and more dominant, more fundamentalist. Um, people became also more and more fragile, um, you know, people becoming like snowflakes and, mm. you know, kind of like we're living in a, a time of sort of in dominant victim culture where you know everybody sort of wants to be a victim people are easily offended and people yeah. want to be, yeah you know they, they want to be protected and um so i think you know we lost a lot of our sense of humor because you know people might have their feelings hurt or whatever and that's sort of been you know considered the highest um priority for some people but you know inevitably as we end up as a society of more and more victims you know we've, we've just become more and more soft-headed and um yeah nobody wants to go too far in that in that direction because um that has consequences do you think it does have consequences do you think that it began in like the early 2000s or more like the 2010s like do you think it's sort of relatively new like in the last 10 years um, that's a very good question. I mean, you know, being a, an observer. You ask intelligent questions. I do. Yeah, no, they are. Um, being an observer of the culture war, I mean, I think myself that political correctness probably really began to make a really strong, serious impact. Probably, I think, probably right back in the late nineteen eighties. To be honest, oh. I, I, yeah, I, I do. I think it became. It started to become, you know, dominant back then. And then going further into the 90s, it just sort of progressed along and then it just sort of like seemingly got worse and worse and worse. And But now I think just in the last maybe three, four, five years, I believe that we've reached what I would call a tipping point. It's reached a point now where people are sick of political correctness. They're, they're, they're done with it. You know, I mean, it, it has its hardcore supporters, but most people, most people who are politically correct, right, are, are not really what I perceive as being hardcore cultural Marxist or anything like that. They're not. Most of it is just people going along with the dominant sort of dogmatism of the time. It's um, it's just like a bit, you know, if you go back and look at other periods of history, if you look at, you know, like in the Soviet Union in the 1920s, most people went along with communism, not because they were necessarily hardcore communists themselves, but simply because that was the sort of the dominant um, and the easiest path to take. It was, yeah, it, it was the product of its time, perhaps? Sorry? It was a product of its time, perhaps? Yeah. Um, same yeah. with, you know, with Nazism in Germany in the 1930s. Again, it was, um, you know, most people were not members of the Nazi party, um, but they were the dominant force at the time and most people just went along with it because that was the easiest road to take. Um, it's the same with, you know, a lot of, you know, Islamic societies, Islamic fundamentalist type societies, some of them are quite radical. And again, mm. it's not that those societies are really dominated by hardline is well it's not that everybody in those societies are like hardline islamists but it's just that you know in, in many societies it's just the easiest path for people to go on and i think that's where it's at with you know modern day political correctness most people are not hardcore cultural marxists they're just no. going along. yeah going along for the ride it is surprising though like i don't know how, how you are in your own personal life but when you sort of talk to friends about the political subject matters, you think that they're on the same page as you with something, and they are with bits and bobs. But like, for example, when I said to one of my best friends, I said, oh, I'm gonna see the movie Unplanned, which is obviously about a woman named Abby Johnson who is anti, um, who wasn't anti-abortion, but she, she worked at a, at a, at a 
at a clinic and then um, she was there for like nine years until she realized and she, until she physically saw the baby being sucked out of the belly. And I told yeah. my friend what the movie was about. She goes, oh, no, I don't, don't want to see that. And I said, oh, well, how come? Um, I said, it's, 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 I think it'll be an interesting movie. It's something different. Um, let's go together. And she's like, no, but um, I'm, I, I can't see that. I'm still pro-choice. And I'm like, you just had a baby and you like, you're still pro-choice. Like these things shock me. I, and in my head, I think that people will think like I do. I mean, it's probably a good idea. No one e ever ends up in here because it's just insanity in there. But generally speaking, I would assume that after you have a baby, you become pro-life. It's just not the case. So do you have any scenarios that um, where, where you think someone is finally clued in on something and then they're still not and like they're not getting that brick wall? Yeah, I think there's always going to be an element of that. Um, you know, you think that, you know, this person's a really sensible person and they'll think this way or they'll think that way or, or whatever, and then they don't necessarily do so. Um, I've had the pleasure recently of reading a wonderful book. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, um, but it's called um, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And it's written by an American author, Dr. Jonathan Haidt. And... No. Um, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. Um, really, really, I would describe it as a breakthrough in human evolutionary psychology. And it, oh, basically, okay. yeah, it basically kind of explains why we actually have the sort of political divisions that we do. And a lot of it really kind of gets back to the fact that, you know, there is kind of like polarity in the way that human beings think. You know, we, we are, some people are like stronger on one side of the brain than what other people are stronger on the other side of the brain sort of thing. And it's like, you know, they've actually worked out increasingly by using brain scan imaging that, you know, the people on the political left, you know, really do think differently to people on the political right. And, mm. um, you know, it, it is because, you know, we have different genes, our brains work differently. And a lot of the way that we think is really already like pre-programmed a lot of it is that you know we we are thinking in a certain way because our genes lead us in a particular way and so you know we, we have that tendency to want to you know demonize people on the other side of politics um but it's not really that some we're not really as terrible as you know the other side thinks we are sort of thing <laughs> all right so in in what you've said then you are not a Christian and I am. So how are we, how have we ended up on the right politically anyway? Um, that's, I find that, I find that somewhat uh, intriguing. Well, so I think, you know, people on, on yeah, people on the, on the nationalist um, sort of right side of politics are, you know, probably fairly broad really in their um, political or religious views. Um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, it's rooted in libertarianism, traditionalism. Um, obviously, Christianity is part of that. Um, but, yeah, I think a lot of it just does get back to the, you know, we, we are probably programmed in one way to think in a, in a certain way. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same with religion. I mean, r religiosity itself is... Is ultimately has a genetic basis. I mean, um, you know, like the scientists have done the research, the more that they actually research genes, for example, the more they find that, you know, um, that there, there are genes that will sort of like, you know, indicate why some people believe in God or believe in a, a deity or a That's divine right source. Or that doesn't make sense. So someone who becomes a Mormon, you can tell they're Mormon by taking the uh, the blood test or something. And someone who's a Lutheran, you can tell what they are based on their genetics. That's silly. That doesn't make sense. I know what you're saying. Uh, Morgan Freeman did a series, a docu series called Finding God or something like that, and yeah. and they tested an atheist as opposed to a to a believer. And there is a difference in in their brain and all that kind of stuff. But you can't you can't genetically there's unless you're jewish which makes sense because they are a, a long lineage of people from the time of abraham um unless you're jewish though there's no there's no um 
religion attached to to blood like you can be indian and hindu right yes that's that's a product of its time and product of its geography but you can be indian and also be a christian so uh, I, I don't know wh what study that that is from because that's so unusual to hear yeah again you know we're, we're also obviously we're influenced by our genes but we're also influenced by our social environment and um you know Obviously, you know, if, if people are, if, if a child is brought up with two Christian parents, for example, there's a pretty good chance they're going to end up Christian as well, as soon as, if their environment. That's true. Yeah. And, that's, and if, yeah, but that's more environment. Yeah. Um, so it, it's not just specific. I mean, there's no, you know, specific gene for Hinduism, for example, or there's no specific gene for Shintoism, or, you know, no. but there is. There are genes for a belief in God. There are genes for religiosity. And, um, I mean, religiosity is something that's, um, you know, it's, it's been a very um, powerful and potent force throughout history because, um, you know, religion has been, in one sense, you know, very beneficial to humanity. I mean, you know, if you, you look historically at the um, different religions and the role that they've um, played throughout history. I mean, re religion has a, an effect of sort of, you know, binding communities together. It sort of helps people to um, have rules for living that helps them to get along with each other and live harmoniously with each other and set standards and set values. And so, you know, people who you know, make people conscientious and make people, um, you know, care about their community, be altruistic instead of hedonistic and selfish sort of thing which is um you know i think one of the big problems that we have in the modern day west as we're sort of losing our um you know religiousness we've become you know increasingly materialistic and hedonistic and that and, you know that has consequences but you know historically um you know religiosity was was very useful and so you know people have passed on you know their genes that sort of favor people being more more religious um but yeah yeah, there's, a, there's a big genetic factor there, but you're right, genes are not everything. It's it's also um, our social environment as well and the different, you know, the information and knowledge and that what we acquire and that, yeah. Yeah, I didn't mean, sorry, I didn't mean to, like, outright dismiss what you said and say, oh, that's retarded. I didn't mean that against you. I meant it against the the study or, any, or whatever it was you were quoting. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, oh, I don't know. I was just, just making sure that I didn't, like, I don't know, offend you or something. Yeah. No, not in the least. Not in the least. Not okay. The least. <laughs> uh, I've been told I need to. I need to be more careful about people's feelings. So, we're trying to be more lefty. <laughs> that sounds so stupid coming out of my mouth. Anyway, all right. Let's move on. So, I think that um, we are. We're not there yet, but you say that we're gathering momentum. I think that's true. But um, I think it has to. We have to hit hit rock bottom before we can go back up. So for that to yeah. happen, I think child. I think like my friends who ha who are parents and their kids. Something has to happen where they where they become super disgusted with something the government's done, or maybe that the government can take a kid away from them if if they do something that the government deems wrong. And then once that happens and that kid becomes the ward of the state, then my friends will be like okay now we know what you're fighting for dear but like at the moment it's sort of like what is she doing um what do you think that it will take something extreme for people to be really aware or do you think it'll just be that one day people will realize that all their rights are sort of disappearing and that that'll be it or like how, how do you think that moment will come about um that is a very good question um thank you what part of it i think is is a is a gradualism, but I also think that you know that that sometimes there there might be like small events that can really change things. Like for example, September 11 back in 2001, um, yeah. that changed the world. Yeah. Um, just you know, like you know, one day, one one series of events, but that really radically changed the world and changed the consciousness. And um, you know, it, it, it's. One of those things, I mean, you know, we've sort of got an ongoing terrorism threat in Australia and um, not just in Australia, but also, you know, throughout the Western world. And even just the other day, there was a you know, horrible knife attack in the UK on London Bridge. And, you know, I think a lot of this sort of thing, you know, it, it's it's sort of changing the consciousness as it becomes increasingly obvious 
to more and more people that, you know, multiculturalism, for example, is not really taking us on the road to paradise. It's kind of taking yeah, us to the other road. And um, so, you know, it's, it's somewhat of a gradual process, but I also think another big thing will be the economy. I think that, um, you know, we've we sort of had basically a long, long period of, in Australia of, you know, sustained economic growth sort of thing, and people have been relatively comfortable, even though you know, household debt levels are astronomical and real estate is really high. And, but that's, you know, got the potential one day. I mean, there's been many, many predictions that, you know, one day the real estate, the property bubble is going to burst and there's people that are going to be in a lot of trouble or some people be in a lot of trouble. Um, and, you know, that, that would change the game. I, I've no doubt that, you know, when, when people feel as though their, um, you know, their, their security is threatened. I mean, human beings like to be secure. We like to feel secure. We like to feel safe, not just from an economic perspective, but also, you know, the way we go about things, we don't want to feel as though there, there's some enemies in our midst who might, you know, blow us up or something. I mean, people don't like that. You know, we like to feel safe and secure. But I think that, you know, any economic downturn, which I think, you know, will inevitably come at some point in the not too distant future, then, yeah, I think that's going to be a game changer, absolutely. Definitely. I think I can agree with all of that. In terms of um, multiculturalism, where do you stand on, like, obviously I'm a first-generation Australian, at least that's the technical term. Um yeah. What, what do you say to people who are like me, um, who, who are first generation Australians? Like, um, I'm not sure how old you are, but say like someone could have come here 70 years ago and then and they're now up to a third generation. Um, and that third generation is very much assimilated and part of Australia. Where do you stand on who is Australian? Like who is Australian to you? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I mean, the way I perceive it is that I, I think being Australian is probably a matter of degree. I think, you know, there are some people who are probably, you know, more Australian than, than others, definitely. Um, but, um, yeah, and then there might even be different tiers of what is Australian as well. Um, sure. And maybe give me, give me, give me the, what, what your, your uh, standard so that I, I'm aware, just because um, I'm obviously, I'm just using myself as the example because I can. I'm obviously biologically and heritage wise, half Colombian, half Spanish. That's that's yeah. what I am. That's what I, I'm proud of my heritage. I mean, I didn't earn it, but I, I like that I'm Latin. I like that I can speak Spanish. I like that I come from like Shakira and Jessica Alba and all these awesome sort of things that people deem, deem um, to be be exotic and all that kind of stuff. I like that I come from all of that. But at the same time, I'm the only Australian that I'm aware of, female, uh, who is who is making a difference. Whereas all my white Australian friends who have been first fleet Aussies, they don't seem to understand or care what's happening or they're just in a bubble that they don't really get it because, you know, they're so basic. So, like, what are your tears? Tell me. Um, yeah, again, I mean, obviously we're all individuals and we all have, you know, different inclinations and different influences and different roles and different destinies maybe and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But um, as far as, um, you know, getting back to what is Australian or whatever, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm an anglo celt and I think, you know, there are probably, um, you know, I'm born in Australia, my, both my parents were born in Australia and, you know, so it's sort of like, you know, I doubt there's there's probably anyone who's sort of more Australian than me sort of thing, but, but at the same time, you know, I don't think you want to sort of get too too involved in purity spiralling or anything like that. That's I mean, that's that's exactly what all the chats do. They say, "Dear, you're not you're not white," or "Dear, you're you're white enough. You're just, you just you just make the cut." Or it's all about the percentage. Oh, it's all about the percentage. So is Mariah Carey technically not American because she's got a bit of black in her and Venezuelan in her, or is she American in like like I don't I don't understand the percentages argument. It's stupid. And um, you are, as you said, an Anglo Celt. So what about the Aboriginals? Like like wh where do you stand on all these tiers that you're referring to? Um, well, obviously the Aborigines are Australian as well because I mean they were you know the Aboriginal people here, and so you know they were obviously a. a a different sort of you know 
type of Australian, if you like. Um, I think it's probably, um, you know, fair to say that they are, I mean, Australia, the very concept of Australia is a, is a European thing. I mean, Australia was, you know, the, the name was, came about of, because of European people and because of, you know, Australia was a, a, a nation um, or became a, a nation. Um, and that, you know, came about because of European colonisation. Um, whereas, yeah, the, the Aborigines were obviously and originally, um, you know, sparsely populated tribal people that were, you know, had vast differences even, you know, within, I mean, we perceive the Aborigines as just being the Aborigines, but in reality, I mean, the Aborigines are, you know, made up of dozens of different tribes and, uh, you know, the, the Noongar people in the southwest of Western Australia are a very different people to the Wick people in far North Queensland sort of thing, you know, they're, like, they're about as different from each other as the, you know, the Spanish are different to the Irish or the Irish are different to the Greeks or whatever, you know, so there's, there's a lot of um, you know, different variation in there. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just getting back to, you know, I mean, people can be of, of different, you know, racial ancestry, but I think, you know, you can also be culturally Australian. You go, I mean, you're an example of someone who, you know, is obviously culturally Australian, speaks with an Australian accent, you're born here, all that sort of thing. So, yeah, there's, there's you know, obviously, you know, there'd be, many many examples of that um yeah your your friend kwaku i mean there's a, you know, a very different background that also you know uh, speaks fluent english with a pretty australian accent if i recall and you know th there's there's many different examples of it i love kwaku he's a good guy i feel sorry i feel like the chat always goes off at him kwaku did 9 11. <laughs> that's funny but i've yeah, made jokes about I've made jokes about him off camera as well, and he doesn't care. It's funny. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw his, um, you know, discussion with Leah Cottrell, which you um, moderated, and uh, yeah, I really I enjoyed that. It, um, but it's still up. I, 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 another channel put it up, and so I've, I've, I've not complained about it. I've left, I've left that channel to have it. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, no, I, th I thought it was a, a very interesting conversation that one. I thought it was too. I, I liked doing it. I was really glad. I thought it was such a good contrast. You have a black guy on one side, a Latina who's sort of like he's the buffer in the middle, you know, sort of, um, you know, almost both, is deemed both races almost, and then you have Blair. <laughs> Just, it was, yeah, it was fantastic. It was, it was, it was great. And but most importantly, the conversation itself, you know, the, the, the issues that were being discussed was, was so fantastic because, you know, you just don't get that type of conversation in the lamestream media, you know. <laughs> you only get that type of conversation in the alternative media, which is why you, my dear, have become such a, you know, a, a, a very valuable commentator because, um, you know, this is, where I think some of the changes are, are happening in our society today because of the alternative media. Um, you know, we, we've sort of been living in an environment where um, for, for a long time, the, the people in positions of power and influence have sort of controlled information. They've controlled the narrative. They've controlled uh, the agenda, if you like. Um, and, you know, it, according to um, you know some analysts, it's 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 effectively like you know they 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 set the boundaries as to what's acceptable and what you can talk about and what you can think about, and, and then you know they they try and keep things within that boundary, and then anything from outside of that, they just don't give oxygen to. They just ignore it, like you know they. And this is why, you know, more and more people are being red-pilled now. We're, we're starting to get, because of the alternative media, we're, we're not only getting more and more nationalist views, we're also getting, you know, all kinds of different information and different values are sort of coming in. We're starting to see, you know, the men's rights movement and just starting to, you know, get more and more, um, what's the word, more and more popular and more and more interest from people um you know when it goes back to you know vaccine skeptics all kinds of different um, movements and ideas and yeah it's, it's it's all very um we get living in a very changing time because people are nowadays being subjected to a much broader range of information and that that's all part of the the shift in consciousness and again if you look back look back at it historically um you know this is part of technological change technological change has always radically changed humanity um one yeah. of the 
Yeah, two of the biggest things that, that changed human beings, I think, um, or changed the modern Western world, um, were technological changes going right back to the early 1960s. And one was the invention of the birth control pill, and the other was the widespread um, proliferation of television. Um, those were two monumental changes that occurred in the Western world in the early 1960s. They were, they were technological changes, but they also prompted radical change in the society. And I think we're seeing something similar now um, because we've got the rise of the alternative media. Um, that also is radically changing our society and it will continue to radically change our society because you know people are simply being subjected to a much broader range of information and the controlled media, the establishment, is not able to control things in the way that they have been able to control things for the last few decades. And, you know, it's a very exciting time in which we're living now, I think. Well, yeah, it's exciting, but it's also um, scary because, like, with the olden days, with the TV, it was like, what, you know, the Brady Bunch and those sorts of shows. That Those were wholesome shows that were encouraging wholesome, pure family values. But now, like the shows like Modern Family, which I, 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 I have the first four or five seasons and I enjoyed it and it doesn't bother me to see the two men together with their daughter. It actually doesn't affect me the way maybe it affects other people and makes them shudder. I don't feel disgust or, or, or anger or hatred towards them, but I feel frustration that these TV shows are trying to normalise something that is technically um, considered to be sinful. I don't want people being mean to gay people. I don't want people hurting them. I don't want anyone bullying them. But at the same time, I don't want that being normalised either. And so, um, you know, I just wish that we were in a time where we were still, you know, families still eat around the dinner table and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, again, I can understand where you're coming from there. It's, um, you know, we are living in a, a time of, you know, this sort of, you know, what, what I call peak liberalism. It's sort of like, I, I don't know if we actually reached peak liberalism yet, but um, we, we, I think we're certainly very close to it if, we, if we're not there now. And, you know, we're, we're seeing those people with, I mean, homosexuality, for example, is, is something that, you know, I mean, many years ago, uh, well, I mean, going back to, say, pre-1960s, before what was known as the counterculture revolution in the 1960s, I mean, homosexuality was sort of like largely taboo in Australian society. It was largely taboo in, in many sort of, you know, Western societies. Um, oh, okay. it, yeah, it, it was effectively, as it is through the vast majority of, you know, cultures throughout the world today and as it has been, you know, through Yeah, well, it's been... Majority, yeah, currently. Um, but it was only sort of, you know, in, in, in recent decades that, it, you know, we, we've sort of gone from giving homosexuality a red light to nowadays we're giving it a bright, green, shiny light sort of thing. It's, yeah, it's, like uh, neon lights, come this way. We're... Yeah, it's a, it's a radical shift. Um, and, and you're not really... So, so where does your perspective on homosexuality come from? Um, what's, the of, what's the foundation of your thoughts and opinions on that? Um, yeah, look, look, I don't really want to go too much into homosexuality. To be honest, it's not an issue that. Well, we're just I've touching. Really... Sorry. We're just touching on it. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, to me, it's it's it is what it is, sort of thing. It's part of. Um, um, just listening to an evolutionary anthropologist, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Edward Dutton. He's a brilliant commentator. He makes lots of um, videos on YouTube. And, and he, he was saying recently about, um, you know, that homosexuality is, you know, likely to be caused by um, certain, um, you know, genetic... Environmental factors. Oh, genetic yeah, factors. Yeah, okay. genetic factors historically that you know like there's the gay the gay uncle theory sort of thing that that um you know homosexuals tend to be you know very effeminate men and um that there may have been some advantages in a society in having very effeminate men rather than having you know, all men being completely masculine there might have been some usefulness in having some men being very effeminate um it's it's probably an evolutionary adaptation um, but obviously, it, it also, I think, becomes a case of, you know, when society's red light something, 
um, they say no to it, and then inevitably you you get less of it. Whereas when you green light something, then inevitably you get more of it. It's like you know if you give a green light to homosexuality, inevitably you know we get more and more homosexuality because society's green lighted it. But it's like that with a lot of other things as well. It's like that with you know if you green light incest, people will you know, you'll get more incest. If you green light cannibalism, you get more cannibalism. If you green light um you know prostitution we get more prostitution um mm. yeah it, there's many things like that and um yeah. you know it, it is it, you know we are living in a, a time now of you know sort of like extreme liberalism in some ways we, we, and you know i i think that will change i think it will it will evolve it always has before and I, I think it will again but um you know this is the age in which we are living now so it is what it is well, regarding, um, we were going to touch on China. I know, so I'll just bring that up and uh, in case I forget. Um, what What are your thoughts on what's happening there in regards to like? So the culture here has changed in the last couple of years. We've that's that's you know blatantly obvious. So what do you think is like? Why do you think what is happening in China is so? Why do you think everyone's talking about it? But when it's like I when I did an interview with James Fox Higgins not too long ago. He said that he doesn't really care and that that's their business. And as horrible as it is and as, as compassionate I feel as I am as a person, I haven't really done much to participate in the subject matter. So um, what, what, why did you want to talk about it and, and um, do you agree that, like, they should just take care of themselves in our business? Yeah, um, well, if I presume you're probably referring to the trouble in Hong Kong at the moment, which is... Um, oh, yes, of course, which is China... <laughs> Um, yeah, which, to, which the list of all of that, which is very interesting because um, it's it's extremely interesting to me in the sense that Hong Kong for so long was kind of like this modern um, sort of you know high tech city state with a sort of like a booming economy. Yeah. Um, it had a, has a, I believe a largely homogenous um, I think their Cantonese speaking population. Um, and British colonized originally, so they they yeah. have they have that sort of Western society that people would be like, oh. Right. So you've sort of like got that strong British um, cultural influence there. You've sort of like got so many factors that sort of had to Hong Kong being this fairly, you know, productive, harmonious type society, and then suddenly, just in the last few months, out of nowhere almost, it's just erupted in violence. Yeah. And all indications are that that violence is not going away anytime soon. In, in fact, it looks like it could get, you know, worse and worse. Um, and, you know, obviously being somebody who does not like the Chinese com communist regime one little bit, I'm sort of, you know, in, in one sense, I would absolutely love the um, democracy um, protesters there to, um, you know, throw off the shackles of Chinese communism and, you know, if yeah. Hong Kong can become an independent country one day, that would be brilliant sort of thing. I, I hope it does become an independent city state one day. But at the same time, I'm also hearing things from Hong Kong that, you know, even the democracy supporters there are becoming quite um, violent and vicious and doing some things that are really sort of um, not very nice. And so it's sort of... Um, you know, it, it, it's not, it, it, it's, I mean, that, that happens, I guess, in in conflict. Um, you know, there, in conflicts, there, there will always be people who, um, you know, take things too far or, or go too far in, in the one direction. I mean, where, where you get conflict between people, I mean, where you get division between people, there's the potential for conflict to arise. And where you get conflict, you have the potential for conflict to amplify. And, um, you know, it, it's very interesting because it's sort of like, you know, well, if they can have that kind of conflict erupt in Hong Kong, well, you know, where else can that happen? And, and also look at France as well with the Yellow Vests movement. I mean, that's been going for about a year or so there now. And um, again, it's it's like, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that people are protesting against Macron and his, um, you know, leadership in France and the people that he re represents because he doesn't represent ordinary French people and that's one of the reasons why the French people are rising up against him sort of thing. But at the same time, it's also a case of, you know, you, you hear about some pretty nasty things that are 
happening from the protesters as well. It's not, it's not like, you know, one side is completely angelic and the other side is completely villainous. It, it, you know, humanity, humanity isn't quite like that. It's, it's often, you know, different shades of grey. And, um, yeah, it, it's going to be very interesting. But, um, I mean, with regard to the, the China situation, I mean, um, obviously we're in a situation in, in Australia where, I mean, when I was a boy, I mean, you know, China wasn't such a big deal. But suddenly it's like just in the last, you know, 10, maybe 20 years, it's like the Chinese economy has been, the Chinese have sort of like abandoned communism and they've just like embraced this, you know, I guess whilst, whilst they've still got the Communist Party in control, they've sort of like embraced market capitalism as being, you know, because that's what works and that's what's more productive sort of thing. And so the Chinese Communist Party has decided that, you know, market capitalism is, is going to take them forward sort of thing. And it's like, you know, they've also realize that you know they can kind of use market capitalism to become ultimately the most powerful nation in the the asia pacific region and ultimately in the world and you know that's that's what they want to do that's what they're trying to do and here we are in australia believing that we can you know sort of like play games with the red dragon that we can sort of like allow them to um, buy enormous amounts of Australian assets, real estate assets, even key strategic assets like um, ports and um, energy supplies and I think electricity, all this sort of stuff um, here in Australia. And it's kind of like, well, so at the same time, we're also importing great numbers of ethnic Chinese into Australia and whilst we've got, you know, like thousands upon thousands of them coming to our universities, we've got... Um, large numbers of Chinese people, um, you know, that in, in some ways they've almost like taken over the universities, well, not taken them over, but they're, they're very influential in the universities. And, you know, it's like the game is completely changing. It's like, you know, our politicians have been asleep. They've either been asleep at the wheel or, or whatever it is, but they think that, you know, we can just trade our backsides off with China, that we can just, you know, continually trade with China, but we don't have to be too concerned about the broader geopolitical side of things. And, um, you know, I believe that our mainstream politicians are, have basically been crazy, they've been blinkered, they've been asleep at the wheel, um, but that is starting to change now. It's starting to change um, because of some of the um, increasing developments that are happening. and. Um, Again, it's, 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 it's very, very interesting. It is interesting. I think what, I think what, um, I think part of the issue is, first of all, China is capitalist communist. That, those are the two titles. I remember one time I said to a friend of mine, I used to work at Officeworks years ago, and when I worked at Officeworks, I had a friend of mine, his name was Jung, and then I said something like, uh, do you like being in Australia or do you prefer the communist system? And he looked at me, he goes, we're not communist. I said, you're not? He goes, no, we're communist capitalist. He goes, the, he goes, it's quite a different thing. And I'm like, interesting. So, like, they don't even see themselves as communist. They see themselves as communist capitalist. So whatever that means, the combination of the two, it's like when people say, oh, well, you know, I don't, it's social, socialist, d democratic socialism. I don't know if that's a made up title, capitalism and communism. I am still doing my course. I've been taking a hundred years to write my last paper, but um, I, I'm learning all these terms and all this kind of stuff. So I'm definitely wise on these, these terms, but what do you think? Like, do, is that an invented term? Do you, because um, as far as I'm aware, the reason they're doing well is because we're giving them our work. We don't, we don't like give, it's always made in China or now Taiwan as well. But like, why don't we do made in Australia? Why? Because it's cheaper there. Um, what are your thoughts on everything I just said? Communist yeah. capitalist, communist yeah, capitalist title and, um, and that we're giving them all our work. Yeah. Those are the two things I said. Yeah. Um, obviously it is. Um, I mean, Ch China for a long time, you know, under Mao Zedong and it was trying to make communism, 
work, but ultimately, uh, that is economic communism. Um, but ultimately, it wasn't working. Uh, the Chinese were kept in poverty. They had um, you know, lots of people going hungry. Um, and at some point, the Chinese regime, the Chinese Communist Party, who are really very pragmatic people in one sense, because um, you know they they absolutely determine that the, the Chinese Communist Party will remain in power in China. In fact, I would describe the Chinese Communist Party as basically being probably the world's biggest and most dangerous gang. That's effectively what they are. And um, yeah, but I mean, at the same time, you know, they will practice capitalism or aspects of market, market capitalism um, because that's what's um, the, the the best chance of advancing communism sort of thing. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it's kind yeah. of like that, that is effectively what they're doing. And, and But also there's an element of, with, with the Chinese, it's also a strong element of ultra-nationalism there as well. Um, obviously, thing, sorry, I missed that. It's a good thing. Nationalism are, is a good thing. Like th that's one thing that we should give them. They have every right for that. Um. Well, nationalism itself. I mean, nationalism. It's pride in country. Pride in in. in yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, nationalism comes in many different forms. If you if you just kind of try and understand nationalism, I mean, obviously, I'm an Australian nationalist. Um. But I would that my nationalism is probably very different to Chinese ultra-nationalism. Well, well, culturally different, but what, all I meant by it was that if it's if their nationalism is defined the way it is here by being proud of what your, your ancestors have achieved and being proud of the country you come from and loving it, then we should give them that. But obviously you're implying that maybe their form of nationalism is a bit dangerous. So I'll let you finish. Your, yes, your... I, I think, I, in all honesty, I think it is because um, their form of um, ultra sort of nationalism, because that, that's what it is with them. I mean, the Chinese Communist Party is basically using a, a sort of a Chinese ultra nationalism as a kind of wedge to unite the Chinese people to see themselves as being, um, you know, this powerful nation that needs to sort of dominate in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, you've also got to remember that China itself is um, a fairly diverse country in, this, in the, the sense that, I mean, back in the early 1950s, they effectively invaded and took over Tibet. Um, also, in the west of China, you've got the, uh, the Uyghur people who are like, you know, Muslim and a different um, population and different people to the sort of dominant um, Han Chinese people. You've also got um, Taiwan, which is obviously when independent many years ago. You've got Hong Kong, which was um, originally, of course, a, a British colony for many years. You've got Macau, which was Portuguese. Um, and you've got you know, divisions in the language there. You've got Ma Mandarin and Cantonese. I don't know, understand a lot of you know, the difference between those two. But um, obviously... Oh, I learned, I learned Mandarin. It does sound quite different to Cantonese. <laughs> okay. Um, but obviously, you know, um, and then the Chinese also have a lot of territorial, um, a territorial, what do you call it, like um, claims to um, various islands in, like, in the South yeah. China Sea. But, uh, yeah, yeah, where they've been disputed with Vietnam and the Philippines and they're sort of, you know, They've got a, a naval presence around, you know, those areas. So, you know, th there's a real potential for conflict. Um, and this sort of the other significant thing about China is that they've had their one child policy for a long period of time. And that's had a significant effect on the population in, in the sense that it's actually weighted um, the male female gender balance. It's, it's not like in most countries it's 50 50 sort of thing. But in China, it isn't. In China, they've got um, more males than females. And, um, you know, that's because of the one child policy and because in China you prefer to have sons than daughters sort of thing. Yeah. In part of rural China, they literally commit infanticide on baby girls. Um, um, and so, you know, that kind of, you know, that, that, that can have a, a potentially dangerous effect on the society where you get, you know, large numbers of, of males who, um, you know, have 
little or no chance of being with a female, little or no chance of marrying. And, and so, you know, that, that can potentially become a bit of a problem in, in the sense that... That's more political, though. That's not... I wouldn't say that the people represent that. I would say that's the government pushing a particular political agenda of that type of pride. So I think I respectfully disagree with you there on that on that particular form. Um, the 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 government's version of of national pride might be dangerous, but I don't think that's the the collective at large that that thinks that way. Um, yeah, it sort of becomes, you know, how much is the is the government a reflection of the people or how much are, are the, the people a reflection of the government, right. obviously. Yeah, there's, there's always going to be a bit of both. Um, you know, you, you'll come across, you know, some ordinary Chinese people who are, you know, absolutely adamant that Taiwan should not be independent. You know, they're like, you know, oh, Taiwan yeah, yeah. belongs to us and we're not giving it up. Yeah. We're not giving up Hong Kong and, you know, yeah. you, you'll get people like that. Um, yeah. But then you'll also get people from Taiwanese ancestry who are like, you know, we are absolutely not going to be part of China. And so, you know, there is a real potential for conflict there. And, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, nationalism, you know, there, there's obviously many good and positive aspects of nationalism. And I mean, if you look at nationalism, this is the point I was about to make, is you, we, we have like, I, I don't know how many countries there are in the world um, exactly. I think it's well over. 150 or something. Um, but when you consider it, you know, it's 150 odd different nations, more than 150. Um, and out of all of those nations, they are all doing some form of nationalism. Every one of them is doing some form of, of nationalism. And um, so, yeah, um, you know, mostly nationalism is fairly harmless and benign, but obviously, um, historically, it, it can be incredibly dangerous and problematic um, if it becomes violent empire building and ultranationalism and that sort of thing as well. Yeah. And that, that's the sort of concern that we might have with China, that the Chinese might, you know, go off on a sort of empire building dominant sort of spree. And especially as they're using their economic power. I mean, they're, they're you know, they've got so much economic power now. They've become so wealthy and, you know, they've got a lot of significant billionaires and they, you know, they fast becoming the world's biggest economy. They're not there yet, but they're, they're becoming the world's biggest economy. There is and so, power. There is super power for sure. Yeah. And so they're able to sort of, you know, spread their tentacles around a bit. And, you know, they've got a considerable presence in Africa. They've got a presence in Sri Lanka. They've got a presence in, um, you know, the, the Pacific. Um, so absolutely, we need to be wary of China. And um, I think the best thing that, Australia can do. I mean, the big mistake that we've made is that we've sort of, you know, made our become so reliant on on China for trade, and um, you know that that that's that's a mistake. We sort of put all of our eggs in one basket when it comes to trade. It's sort of like you know we've got these cheap Chinese imports sort of thing, and um, you know that that can be. It's it's been very problematic from a geopolitical perspective to have all of your eggs in one basket. Um, but part of the problem is that, you know, we have a, a very, I think, very arrogant class of politicians here in Australia who, you know, think that they can, yeah. they're so clever that they can, you know, can control everything and if anything goes awry or any problems arise, then they'll be able to, you know, just micromanage the crap out of everything. Yeah. And uh, I, I think they're, um, I think they're very silly. I think they're playing with fire and I, I think that um, inevitably, um, you know, the chickens come home to roost sort of thing. Um, very yeah. interesting. Yeah, sorry, go. No, I just said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said very interesting and then. Yeah, very interestingly, we, I, I don't know if you saw on um, 60 Minutes a couple of uh, weeks ago, they had that Chinese defector on there. His name was uh, Wang somebody or other. Oh, actually, um, I didn't see that. Yeah, which was really, really interesting because, um, I mean, there's been some speculation that this guy was like, you know, either not a high level defector or he may have had his own agenda. Some people were speculating he might have been a paid actor or something like that. Um, I don't agree with that myself. I think he is absolutely genuine. Um, but what's significant is that, you know, this guy was on Australian television and he was revealing things like, you know, that the Chinese have 
um, got a plan to infiltrate the Australian Parliament, that they're, you know, heavily involved in spying on Australia. All and about it. Yeah. That's great. And the fact that it was on television, I think, is an absolute game changer because you can see now that our, our leadership are responding to it. It's like they know, oh, no, this guy was on TV. You know, it's like, you know, mm -hmm. we, now we, we have to, um, like, SCOMO, uh, Scott Morrison, our Prime Minister, um, announced, I think it was today or yesterday, where he said that, you know, now we're setting up some $88 million task force to sort of you know, counter the foreign espionage threat or something. Um, it's like, you know, something... It could be a diversion. Channel 9, it, I would say, is part of the establishment. That could be a diversion. That could still be a plant. But it's good that that we know about it because did you watch the did you watch the 60 minute segment where they had uh prince philip or was it prince andrew prince andrew and, and how they said um they didn't really say that they said a couple of things that he that clued to me that it was a very good news story but still very much establishment controlled with the things that they said about um epstein's uh suicide and all that kind of stuff. Um, so that I haven't seen it. So I'm obviously just speaking out of my ass right now. But uh, it's possible that that's still very establishment led. That that piece that you you're talking about with the Chinese fella. Um. Yeah. It, it, it's. I mean, I've observed in the last few probably months. I would say mm -hmm. we've actually seen segments of the Australian media, and it's actually been led, believe it or not, by the left media, um, where the what narrative... Is the left media, sorry, well, what is the truth? The so we're talking ABC, we're talking Fairfax. It hasn't yeah. been, it hasn't been the Murdoch press. For, for, in fact, for years, the Murdoch press was largely silent on the whole China thing. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Oh, well, that's good then. I, I hope I'm wrong. I would prefer to be wrong. I just, I'm just inputting my two cents. <laughs> Yeah, but it's actually been um, more and more articles coming from the ABC, SBS, Fairfax, and sources like Channel 9, where suddenly, you know, they've been writing articles, you know, warning about the China threat, warning about, you know, the, the Chinese infiltration of our universities, the Chinese mm -hmm. infiltration of our politics, the enormous amounts of money that's being donated by powerful Chinese business interests to politicians mm -hmm. and their, you know, the, the, the influence that they're having in Australia. And um, whereas, you know, five years ago, they weren't talking about that very much, but in the last that's few months, they have. Um, yeah. very, very, very significant book I want, I want to um, mention um, Go ahead. We'll probably finish up now. Um, yeah, I'm well, super tired. <laughs> book I want to mention called um, Silent Invasion by uh, Clive C. Hamilton. Um, yeah. Wonderful book. This guy, Clive Hamilton, was, was a very um, academic fellow. Um, actually, he was a, trying to remember what his qualifications were. He was involved in some kind of ethics centre. And anyway, this guy was, I think, perceived as being something of a, a bit of a sort of a lefty rather than a right wing source. Oh, okay. And he's the guy who's, you know, really spilt the beans on China with his wonderful book, Silent Invasion. Yeah, um, I've read that book and I encourage others to read it as well because it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a real, very eye-opening, very interesting book and it's just some, you know, something that people should read. Good to know. Well, I'll, I'll probably maybe see if I can pop the description pop a link in the description box below if people want to, like, access that book or something. Um, but uh, I've really enjoyed our discussion. It was highly intellectual and we, we touched on a, on a whole series of, of different topics. Did you feel like we managed to get a lot out? Yeah, thank you so much, dear. I, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we'll we'll talk again at, at some future point. But um, thank you very much for letting me have my say of you know had said a little bit about China and a bit about the culture war and um, hopefully um, people have enjoyed our conversation. Well, I'm sure they will to to brains like ourselves. I did want to just add something at the end here just to say for people who are not aware. I'm not sure if anyone knows this or does or doesn't know this. I learned this years ago and I've always found it quite amusing. Australia 
originally was called Austria Lia, was named by a Spaniard. Just thought I'd chuck that in there before I end the broadcast. <laughs> okay, I have to admit I don't know much about that, but um, yeah. Um, um, if people want to prove me wrong, they can, but I'm not because I learned that at the Immigration Museum. <laughs> okay, I have to admit I don't people, know much about that. I just think it's funny that my people named this country. <laughs> I'm not disputing it. I'm not agreeing with it. I just do not know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know, I know. It's fine. All right, I'm going to end the broadcast now. And um, thank you so much. If anyone wants to communicate with Australian Protectionist Party, you have a Facebook page and a Gab um, link, correct? I'll pop them in the description box below for, for anyone interested in having a chat with you. Thank you very much, dear. Yep, our website is www.protectionist.net. And yes, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on YouTube, and we're on Gab. Um, send me all of those in, in, in a column and I'll pop them in the description box below. I'll do that. Thank you so much, dear. It was a pleasure. Well, this is such a pleasure. Okay, thanks, guys. Um, hopefully, I think next week my, ne my guest will be my friend Diane. It'll be just a silly session and it'll be called Ask Diane, but I'm not positive. So um, don't hold me to it. See you later, guys. End broadcast.